Hi everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. If you've had an encounter of your own and would like to speak with me whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. Tonight's guest wishes to remain anonymous, so I'm just going to refer to him as Chaz during this interview. Chaz, welcome to the show. Thanks, Vic. Glad to be here. Thanks for coming and doing the show. I appreciate it. Chaz, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, let's see. Currently, I live in a small fishing village in Alaska. I'm 63 years old. I'm retired due to health reasons. Prior to retiring, I was basically working in the construction trades for the past 40 or so years, and uh, I'm a retired electrician, and I worked in the marine industry here and doing marine electric and doing industrial and residential projects and also uh, remote wilderness lodges I developed and built off-grid codependent power systems for that. I've raised a whole parcel of kids and just enjoying life. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. From talking with you about all the things you've done in your life in the pre-interview, Jazz, if people lived half the life you've lived, they'd be doing something, I'm telling you. Uh, I've had people tell me that, and I always feel like I probably should have done more. (laughs) I don't see how you could have, to be honest with you. (laughs) When you were growing up, what kind of interest did you have in monsters and things that go bump in the night? Well, a lot. I mean, I collected all the trading cards from the monster movies. I read tons of comic books, uh, of course. I was pretty much your typical kid. and I actually built all the, uh, I think it was Ravel that made the movie monster models and that was a big deal for me building hot rods and movie monsters and so I had a whole collection sitting on my dresser of the wolf man and Dracula mummy creature from the black lagoon and yeah so yeah but I was really interested in that I would also try and watch my parents were pretty strict though I grew up in the bible belt and they don't call that that for nothing and my mom was in particular, my dad was a little more relaxed about it, but my mom, she was pretty strict about what I could watch or couldn't watch. So a lot of times I'd stay up and kind of sneak out in order to watch what my dad was watching without getting discovered. But I had a big interest in anything strange or unusual, any kind of science fiction or scary movie that had to do with things like Wolfmen. And so, I, I mean, those are probably some of my favorite movies to this day are the werewolf movies. I always found them fascinating. And I do believe that it was because of this incident that we're going to talk about that happened to me when I was a kid. Well, after you had that experience, like you just mentioned, when you were eight, it's only natural, I guess, that you would be fascinated with the topic. But, yeah, that's something, like you said, we'll get into later on. You've only shared the details of your encounter with a handful of people, even though your encounter happened, like I said, when you were eight. Why did you decide to come forward and share it on the show with us tonight? Well, I became an avid listener a couple of months back, and I've listened to a lot of the shows that are on YouTube and read some books about the Michigan Dogman, and it was that kind of epiphany that I became familiar with, that there was other people out there who had seen this sort of thing, which I never, ever had heard of from anyone until the advent of the internet and YouTube, which is how I learned about any books that were out there. And it was something that I just had never heard of before. I'd heard about people having seen Bigfoot, for instance. But at that point in time, I didn't know anyone who had seen what I had seen. And when I had seen it, I just really didn't know what to make of it. I I really didn't. I tried to understand it through the eyes of an eight-year-old. And uh, I wasn't a very worldly eight-year-old. I pretty much spent my time playing baseball, riding my bike, and going on adventures with my friends in our neighborhoods and on the farm that I grew up on. You know, I was pretty much just your average typical kid who really didn't know much other than the world that he was immersed in. So it was kind of a hard one for me to comprehend 
fortunately, I had my grandmother, and if I hadn't have had her in my background, she was actually instrumental in me being able to actually accept it just by being the person who she was. She was an incredible human being. She was a quarter blood Indian, so she was one fourth Aglala Sioux. Not only was she that, she was also Irish English, and she had grown up in the hills of Kentucky, and so she had had a more even unusual life, I believe, than what I had. And it was her sharing of her stories from her childhood and some of the things that she had witnessed that helped prepare me for that. And as a result of that, I always felt like I walked away from that with less emotional baggage than I would have had otherwise. I don't care how old you are, it's never a good age to have a dog man encounter, but when you're eight, yeah, that just makes it that much worse. That's horrible. Before you tell us about your encounter, Jazz, please tell us about the place where it happened. Well, I grew up in the state of Illinois, in Will County, on a parcel of land that my father had purchased from my grandfather that was directly adjacent to the 100-acre farm that my grandfather worked. Uh, that had been in our family for quite a long time. The farmhouse on the farm was actually built in the 1850s. And my great-great-grandfather, he was a preacher man. And that farmhouse was actually part of a series of, uh, what would you call, entry points for the Underground Railroad prior to the Civil War and just after also for former slaves. And also, even though the Civil War came and went, slaves had plenty of problems in those days, even in the aftermath of the Civil War. And so he was a firm believer in abolition. And so he fought in the Civil War on the side of the Union Army as a captain with a distinguished career. And uh, then went back to being a preacher man, living on this farm and doing what he did. So the farm's been around for a long time. It is located just south of a creek that runs through it. There's woodlands on it. Uh, it's quite a bit different now than it was when I was a kid because that entire area south of Chicago has really grown up. You know, at the time that we're talking about when this incident occurred, there was a population of about 3,000 in that township. And then prior to that, during the Depression, my family had essentially owned the majority of that property, if one can say that you can actually own property. Originally, it was all belonged to the Indians, but at some point, my great-great-grandfather had purchased all that land, 10,000 acres, and then my great-grandfather was forced to sell it during the Depression. And so all they ended up keeping was a 100-acre farm. And then they lease farmed for other landowners in the area. One of the reasons that I'm kind of keeping my privacy uh, about that is I still have a lot of family members that live there, and I don't want to cause them any kind of distress in telling the story. So I understand why you'd want to do that, and as always, that's not a problem. All right, Chaz, please tell us about your encounter. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Well, like I said, my father had built a house upon a piece of land that he had bought from my grandfather that was directly adjacent to the farm and directly west of the farmhouse, the main farmhouse, by about 200 feet. And there was a number of buildings on the farm itself and several large barns and the equipment sheds and all these also dated back into the 1800s. And then there was basically lots of fields and whatnot. And so where our northern edge of the property butted up to was essentially a fence line on that little same road that the main farmhouse was on. We had a lot that was probably, oh gosh, I know our backyard was at least 70 feet from the north edge of the house to the boundary line. And the lot itself was probably 120 feet wide or so, maybe 100 feet wide. So the house was essentially uh, a ranch-style house that sat upon a finished basement that went about three-quarters of the way below ground. So the main portion sat about four foot above grade, all of which was, that was situated at the front of the property, which is higher than 
than the rest of the parcel. That slopes lower in the elevation by about five to seven feet towards the north edge, which was defined by that fence line. And also that was the enclosure where my grandfather kept about 70 to 80 feet at that time, a recently built enclosure, about 12,000 square feet, about 120 by 100 foot enclosure, which he had built because of problems that they were having. But for the most part, they were crop farmers, growing mostly corn, soy, and wheat, having given up on raising sheep because of loss of livestock. But in those days, they were just beginning to try raising sheep. So that led up to what was going on on the farm at the time. So I think at the time of the incident, I'm pretty certain by recollection and by everything that I was eight years old. And I lived in the house in a bedroom where I slept, me and my brother slept, was in the northeast corner of the house that faced onto the backyard. And we had two windows in there. And one of them was on the north wall, uh, about three feet in from the eastern wall. And there was another window about two feet from the north wall facing east. So I could actually see my grandparents' farmhouse from there. And from the other window, I could look out and see the backyard, which, by the way, had about five or six trees in it, crab apple trees. I think we had two apple trees, a crab apple tree, and a, I think a maple tree, and they weren't really big. They were fair size, medium size, but this particular night was more than likely, according to my figure, in either mid-April or mid-May. I can be pretty sure about that because of the phase of the moon, the fact that it was between a half to three-quarter moon. So where I was in the bedroom, I had the, the bed was actually laid out east to west, and the headboard of the bed sat underneath the eastern window and alongside the northern window. And I was in the habit, and I still am, of sleeping with the curtains drawn closed. Each window had curtains, which came to about an inch above the windowsill. So there was this little gap there that I used to as, like to peer out from. But I would keep the windows themselves open to about four to six inches to receive the benefit of fresh air while sleeping, as was the custom of my father and my grandfather. And my grandfather knew this and had recently asked me to keep my eyes and ears open since they had found some sheep that had been slaughtered in the fields in the months before. And they had fenced in and were currently keeping the sheep in that enclosure, which bordered up against the backside of one of the larger barns. And so where I was in that room, I was able to see partially into the enclosure, out into the field, that area that was fenced, in between the trees, which were spaced about 30 feet apart, 20, 30 feet apart, and scattered throughout the yard. So I had a somewhat good view of what was going on, but not an overall view, uh, just only on the south and the west section of that enclosure. But he had asked me to keep my ears and eyes open to see if I saw anything, knowing that I slept there and that I slept with the windows open. Now, there's a lot of wildlife that came through there, like pheasant, grouse, quail, fox, weasel, rabbit. Once we even caught a badger in our yard, I actually tried to catch him. And he got away because he shredded everything that we tried to catch him with. Well, my father and his crew tried to catch him with. But at the same time, people, had, when they had been in the fields, they knew that there was a pack of wild dogs that they would see out in the fields. And so at the time, he was feeling like it was these wild dogs that were doing this to the sheep. So... Anyways, I think that night, it was a noise that woke me up more than anything. And I heard the sheep bleeding, and I instantly woke up, and I remembered that I was supposed to look and see if what was going on when I, if I heard that noise. I raised my head up and peered out under the curtain, that little one-inch gap, through the open window, through the screen, into the backyard, and beyond the fence, and I saw right away that the sheep were 
neighborhoods, definitely all of them were milling about as if they were trying to get away from something. And they were kind of going in this elliptical circle almost and running back and forth, but staying crowded over to the southeastern edge of the enclosure. It was about, a, I think, a 12,000 square foot enclosure. And as I was watching that, trying to peer and see if I could see dogs in the pen with them, I noticed something standing in between where I was and about 30 feet down below me, which was probably about five to six feet lower in elevation due to the slope of the backyard, I noticed what appeared to be a figure standing behind one of the trees. Now, it was hard to get a good look at it right then because it was in the shadow in a place where I couldn't see it really well. And so it just looked like the black figure of a, of a man. And I, I wasn't sure about that, and I'm looking at it, and as I looked at it, it stepped forward. And as it stepped forward, the first thing I thought was, wow, what's this guy doing in our backyard, and it's pretty late. And at the time, I didn't exactly know what time it was, but judging now from my remembrances of how the way the light was filtering through the yard at what angle, and knowing that I was on this axis and the way that the moon goes, I'm pretty sure that it was somewhere after midnight because the moonlight was coming down a bit from the left and from behind me. So as I was looking at this thing, I couldn't see it real well, but I knew one thing that it was all in black. I thought it was a man dressed all in black. And then I also, my initial impression was that this thing had some kind of hat on. So I kept staring at it, and it took a couple of steps forward out of deep shadow into much less shadow and into partial moonlight coming through the branches of the trees. And when I saw what it was, I was paralyzed, just absolutely just couldn't believe what I was seeing. Didn't still had the hardest, and for years had the hardest time trying to understand what this thing was. And it wasn't until I actually got a chance to listen to some other people's experiences that started putting it in perspective for me. I, I, I mean, I was convinced with my eight-year-old brain that this thing was um, what I could only call as a werewolf. I wasn't even sure to call it a wolfman because it didn't look at very much like the Wolfman model that I had of Lon Chaney sitting on my dresser. It was different from that. So I was looking at it. It was, was moving forward, and a couple of things struck me as really odd that made it difficult for me to wrap my mind around it. One of those things was the fact that it looked like it was walking on high heels <laughs> because it seemed to be moving on the balls of its feet. It seemed to have two knees, so to speak, in its legs. One knees that bent forward and one knee that bent back that was lower down above where the ankle would have been. And so I just didn't know what that was or what that meant. I've never seen any kind of bipedal creature still having to this day that does that other than maybe, what, a kangaroo or something? But as I was looking at it and as it, and it was slowly moving and it was slowly panning its vision. So it was its head was when I when it got out into the light I could see that it wasn't a hat that it had on, but that it had fur and ears on top of its head. And the fur was dark black, like uh, kind of a coal black and it wasn't shaggy, it was short. So its hair reminded me a lot of some kind of uh, Labrador or something, only a little thicker than that, like each hair was thicker, but not real long. And I'd have to say it stood about, uh, just from my, from my kid perspective, six foot three, six foot six, maybe seven foot. I don't want to say any bigger than that, which led me to some later on conclusions, but at the time, I didn't know what I was looking at. It had an eye shine. 
the eyes were greenish, but later on in the encounter, when it turned towards me more, the color went from green to yellow. So I'm sitting there, and it's moving with such stealth and intensity that I just felt like it had a purpose, like it was heading somewhere and it was paying attention. And it stopped and peered east towards the farmhouse and it was carefully scanning the horizon trying to see what was going on now it was continuing now to move its head towards me and before it got all the way turned towards me i ducked down because i was afraid that it might see me through the gap there and i waited i don't know how long 30 seconds 45 seconds maybe and figured I'd carefully go back up and peer again. And it was still there, having taken maybe another step forward. When it was moving, speaking of which, when it was moving, it had two arms. And I couldn't see its paws or whatever you want to call its hands very well because they were curved inward, like an, oh, a semi-fist or like a slightly closed hand but its arms were bent and its elbows were near its side and when it moved when it stepped forward with its right foot the right arm would move forward with that and when it moved with its left foot forward the left arm would move with that staying at that almost like the position that if you just hold your hands out not straight out at your shoulder but down about where the your elbow makes a 90 degree bend. I was trying to look at them because I, I didn't understand what I was seeing. At first, when I looked at it, I thought it was a guy. And I actually honestly thought this guy looks like a guy in a tuxedo because it looked like it had some kind of coat on the way the fur went. But then as it came out of the shadow and more into the light, I could see that it wasn't a coat, a black coat. It was actually fur. And the thing on its head was actually its ears and the fur on the top of its head. And this is when I got a better look at its face. Back then, I didn't know too much about dogs and breeds, although later on in life, I got to see a lot more different types of dogs and whatnot, especially when I moved to Alaska. And it reminds me of, if I can use what I know now, it looks like a Malamute's face. Only instead of having hair on its the extended portion that's guess considered the snout and the mouth, it had a leathery type. I don't know how to say it. I it it was like this. It was a blacker black than the fur in some spots, and in other spots it wasn't. But it was extremely muscular. It had really defined thighs, a broad V-style chest. The arms weren't super large, but they were defined. And you could see the definition underneath the fur. And the inner side of the arm, like if you look at the inside of your arm that's on the same side as your palm, that had that same leathery look to it that the torso did, which looked like burnished leather, not like polished shoe leather, but like if you were to have the raw leather hide and and buff it with a cloth or something. It would have a kind of a flat, almost a satin appearance, but very tough, very strong looking, and very defined. You could see every striation in the abdomen and in the pectoral muscles on the chest. Now, I'm looking at this, and when I first looked at it, I thought that was a vest of some sort, and then once it came more into the light, I realized, oh my God, that's like some kind of part of the body so at this point I was just sitting there trying to make sense of what I was seeing and really looking at it and looking at the nose it had teeth it had fangs but not big fangs like I later on became accustomed to seeing in werewolf movies like dog soldiers so probably half the size of the fangs that you'll see on the creations that they used for that movie but still definitely fangs and definitely larger slightly larger than, like, say, on a full-grown German Shepherd. 
and it did actually look the face actually did look well i actually come close here in alaska to uh wolves and the face did look very wolf-like but even more in between a malamute and a wolf but the teeth especially looked more wolf-like than you see on a malamute and then it moved forward but it moved forward with grace not like it was shaky because I was thinking, why is it standing like it's wearing high heels? Because I saw that's the way the foot seemed to be positioned. And I never quite figured that out, of course, until much later, probably this year, listening to your show and looking at more pictures and that, and realized that that's some kind of anomaly of that leg of that creature. That's how those legs are built, like they're double-jointed or something. So at this point, it had moved forward into the light, and the sheep were going crazy. And this thing was not paying attention to the sheep. And that was one of the things that really was like a big question that I had. How come the sheep are going crazy when this thing doesn't seem to be in the same enclosure with them? And I was looking at the sheep, and they weren't looking at this thing. They were looking at something else that was in the pen in the enclosure area. So I had that question. I never saw anything in the enclosure, but I just could see the way the sheep were reacting, the way they were moving about. And years later, as I thought about it with an adult mind, I believe that there was something else in that enclosure. What it was, I don't know. I didn't see it. But at that point, I shifted as I was looking at the sheep and at the creature walking and looking past, I shifted in the bed and I made a creak. And right then that thing swiveled his head and looked straight at me. And I admitted I made that sound, I dropped. I mean, I saw it swivel straight at me. I knew it was looking directly at me. And I just dropped down below the window and just froze. I uh, tried to stay as quiet as I could for about, God, I had to I was like sitting there for two or three minutes, and the only thing that made me get back up was the fact that this thing looked for all intents and purposes that it was going towards my grandmother's house, my grandfather's and grandmother's farmhouse. So I was like, oh, man. And so I got back up after about two or three minutes. I don't know how much time actually passed. could have been as little as a minute. could have been as much as three peered out carefully. This time I was a little more towards the corner of the window to the left because I figured it had been moving forward and I wanted to see if it had traveled. Wasn't sure whether or not it had spotted me because I had an excellent hiding spot to see it from. And I couldn't see anything. And I looked and looked and looked, but I only looked as I thought about this over the years back then. I figured this thing was just going to keep slowly moving forward and it should have been somewhere there in and amongst the several trees that it would have had to pass through to get onto the, there was actually a dirt road on the other side where our property had butted up to grandfather's place and that ended there and there was a corn crib over there and so it was kind of wide open there and I couldn't see anything and I waited in case it had ducked behind a tree and it was waiting to come out and I waited what I thought was appropriate amount of time and then I moved on the bed, over to the other window, carefully, quietly, as much as I could, and started scanning the immediate vicinity, all the trees that were, and I looked to my right, looked to my left, saw the corn crib, saw the trees, and carefully tried to, because originally when I first seen it, it was standing behind this tree. So I looked at every outline of every tree, and at this point, from where the moon was, this was pretty good vision. This was much better vision from that direction, looking towards the east, because the moon was back behind me. So I kept staring, tried to adjust my eyes, looked as much as I could, because I was really concerned about this thing was going to my grandparents' farmhouse. And I couldn't see anything. I could see the trees. I could see the shape. I should have been able to see this thing if it had been there. Now, as I think back, I mean, this thing was powerful enough that it could have leapt into a tree, for all I know. So I must have spent about 15 minutes 
trying to see if it had continued or if it had taken off. My young mind, I ended up thinking, oh, this thing got scared when it heard the noise and it left back the way it had came because I couldn't see it in the other direction. And so this made perfect sense to me. And I thought about going to wake up my dad, and I thought, man, I'm going to get in trouble if I do go wake him up. My mom is going to be upset. She's not going to let me watch any kind of scary movies. or <laughs> It was going to ruin my childhood. That's what, that was the impression I got, that if I said anything, no one would believe me, and I, I just have nothing but grief because of it. So just slunk down in bed, crawled under the covers, Pulled the covers over my head and I instantly slept. I was tired. I was that amount of focus and concentration was far beyond anything I'd ever attempted or pulled off at that point in my life. And woke up the next morning and first thing I thought of when I woke up and I thought about what I'd seen the night before and I started thinking about it. Started going, was it real? Did it really happen? And I went in the backyard, looked around, seeing if I could see any kind of footprints or actually checked the trees, see if there was any fur on the trees, didn't find anything, you know, and decided to essentially to keep my mouth shut about the whole thing and just kept it kind of close to the vest and mentioned it occasionally, told almost every member of my immediate family, my children and my partner, and told them. Some of them believed me, some of them didn't. I don't think any of them really took it super seriously, but they did listen patiently. Oh, I think my oldest son was the one who kind of had the hardest time believing it, and he would say a few things and kind of look at me like, well, now, surely this had to have been some kind of misunderstanding of some sort, and he still doesn't like it when I bring it up and mention it to him, <laughs> so I don't. <laughs> but like I say, I had this incredibly loving grandmother who had told me plenty of stories that were of this kind of nature of unusual things that she had witnessed in the woods down in Kentucky. And I felt okay about it. And I never told her, never told my grandfather, though the next day they did find some dead sheep in the pen. And they wouldn't let me see them. I wanted to see them at that age. They weren't about to let me see them especially with my mom and my grandma around. My grandpa had asked me, I believe he, I can't remember exactly, but I do believe that he asked me if I had heard anything or seen anything. And I remember just dumbing up about it because I just felt like no one's going to believe me. So I didn't say anything. That's pretty much what happened. Even though your grandma was open to strange things, you said you never told her about what you had seen that night. Why was that? Well, I didn't have the feeling that this thing had evil intent. Like, I was debating when it was heading towards the farmhouse that if it continued in that direction, I was going to go wake my dad and try and get him to call Grandma and Grandpa and let them know what was happening. But since I didn't see this thing continue on, and I looked hard enough and long enough to convince myself whether or not I was accurate or not, I don't know. But at that age, I was pretty certain that this thing had not continued on towards the farm. So my grandmother was not in danger. And I just didn't want to bring it up. I didn't want to mention it. I just felt like if I did that, it would be the wrong thing to do. And I just had that feeling. And I don't know why. My grandmother would share those sort of things with me, no problem. But I was just eight, and I know that even prior to building that house, we had lived in the farmhouse with my grandparents, and my mom had taken me to see, I think it was Sleeping Beauty, and they had that witch in Sleeping Beauty, and after that, I just couldn't sleep alone. I think it must have been five years old or something, and I just cried and screamed. I wanted her to leave the door open. She closed the door to the room. And I cried and screamed, and it caused a big ruckus that I was not to be allowed to see the scary things, even like Sleeping Beauty, you know. And so I'm pretty sure that ha that was the main reason, the fact that that episode of me getting 
scared and not wanting to be left alone in a room with the door closed was what backed me off from mentioning it to my grandma. I still think about that. When I think of the concept of telling them, I was into doing it if that thing was moving towards me. Now, after everything I know, that thing probably did move on and pass that farmhouse. I don't know. Maybe it did take off the other way. But at that age, being eight, I just didn't have a clue what was really happening or how dangerous that could have been. And also the main fact that while I was watching this thing, this thing did not strike me as evil. It struck me as powerful. It struck me as something that I couldn't even comprehend what it was. I did not know what it was. I couldn't even call it a wolfman because it did not look like the Han Chaney's wolfman. It didn't look like that. It had a bodybuilder's physique, and it had a completely different head. I mean, the Lon Chaney Wolfman actually looks partially human. This thing, while it struck me as human in terms of physique, its head did not look human. Its head looked more like that god Anubis from Greek mythology, from hieroglyphics. But I didn't think that it was evil. It seemed as if it had a purpose. And thinking back, I think it was hunting or it was the lookout. So I puzzled on it long and hard for many years. And I don't think I ever got answers until the past year. Well, I'm glad you're able to connect so many of the dots this past year. That's a good thing. And speaking of its physique, how did its arms compare in length to its body? Well, that was another funny thing about it. You see, the legs appeared longer to his body, but it had a long torso, and it had this V chest, but the arms were shorter. I know they were bent, but I expected much longer arms for it. Maybe it was because I was, because of the way the fur on the upper arm was blending in with the fur on the side of the body or something. I don't know, but it seemed like shorter arms, not as short as like you get when you look at T-Rexes and they have those ridiculously short arms, but about two thirds or three quarters the length of what you would expect. But then when I was looking at it with eight year old eyes, I was looking at it like it was a man and I was judging it all from a man, not as a cryptozoological unknown species, which I had almost no knowledge of other than the stories my grandmother had told me. And even those, they were considerably different from what I was witnessing. So I don't know what to make. I do know that on the snout, on the upper part of the snout, it was leathery, just like the torso and like the inner part of its arms. But there was no shagginess to the hair, which was interesting to me because later on, most of the movies that you watch, I think, what was it, Silver Bullet? They had a werewolf in that movie, which when I watched that movie, I thought that's fairly similar hair length to what this one had. Maybe the hair on this one laid down a little nicer. It was definitely darker, but similar, similar looking to that, only nowhere near as big. I think the Silver Bullet werewolf is like seven, eight feet. And this thing was under seven feet as far as I can correctly ascertain, trying to judge everything from almost a 55-year difference in time. So, yeah, trying to think of any other unique anomalies that I noticed on that thing. Just its stealth. The thing that really stood out was its stealth. And it was probably the stealthiest I've ever seen anything move. Unbelievable, just how smooth and how completely powerful. It wasn't jerky, wasn't unsteady, knew exactly what it was doing. Highly intelligent, thinking back on how it moved and how it was able to observe and scan. It had to have incredible vision to be able to see really well, like it was appeared to be seeing. It had to have really good hearing in order to hear slight noise that I made 30 feet away up inside the room. And then also it had to have some kind of intelligence in order not to be distracted by what the sheep were doing. And that was something that also stood out. 
prominently was the fact that it was not distracted by whatever the sheep were doing. It was focused on doing its thing, whatever its purpose was. But, yeah, definitely got the sense that it was some kind of flesh and blood, though, like it was a real creature. From the way you described its posture and its movements and its behavior, it sure sounds to me like maybe there was another dogman out there chasing the sheep and giving them a hard time, but I guess we'll never know. When it stepped out of the shadows and you were able to get a good look at it, was its head proportional in size to its body? Yes, it was. The head was proportional. The head wasn't bigger, and that was one of the more interesting things, and that also lent it to seem like it was... I mean, it was a bigger head than, say, a dog's head. But in comparison to the rest of its body, it was very proportionate. And it actually lent to the human-like appearance of it, even though it was obviously some kind of dog-wolf head on it. The way it held its head, its posture was perfect. It had the best posture. I'm not even sure if that right at that time, but I know later on my brothers and I were into lifting weights and we would get magazines on junior bodybuilding and back in that day i'm not sure if frank zane had made a name for himself but i know that in those years i was real aware of who frank zane was because i thought this guy had achieved one of the better physiques that was out there in the bodybuilding kingdom and i probably would say that if you could take this thing give six inches to frank zane and cover him in fur. And even when I look at the way Frank's head sits on his body, he has pretty good posture. He has a pretty strong neck, although Frank's neck is longer. than this thing did not have a long neck. It probably had a neck that was a couple inches shorter than a human neck. It was the intelligent look on its face that really made it really hard to understand what I was seeing. I mean, at the one hand, I'm looking at this thing that looks like some kind of dog or wolf standing up and I looked for a tail and I couldn't tell speaking of dog or wolf I couldn't tell whether or not this thing had a tail but that was because the back end was kind of in the shadow more and I looked carefully to see if there was a tail but then when it would move I was looking at other things and I never could define whether or not there was a tail though there could have been a tail that was laying flat along its backside down maybe the left-hand leg. And I couldn't see it because it was just blending in, being the same dark fur color in the shadow area of the tree. But that really threw me, looking at this thing and trying to decide, is it human? But if it's human, why does it have a dog's head? At one point I even thought, is this a human that has a fur coat on with a dog's head mask or some kind of dog mask on over its head just because of the way it moved but then when i'd look at the feet the bottom of the legs threw that right out that didn't make sense and i just didn't know what to make of it <laughs> it perplexed me for a long time but i mean i know it had an emotional impact for me i should say that it didn't cause me any distress I was trying to make sense of it, and I was trying to, well, how come I'm the only person who's ever seen this? And then it wasn't until the Internet that I began to realize, like, other people have seen it, not just one or two other people, but lots of other people have seen this. And not only that, there's more than one type. That really boggles my mind, but makes sense. There are lots of different types of critters out there, and anything could be going on with that entire situation. So, yep. There are so many things about dogmen that are just so hard to understand. It's almost like you can just take your pick. But besides the sheep that were being killed before you had that encounter, did you ever see or hear anything that made you think some strange creature like that might have been lurking around your property? Never. I always felt comfortable there. And there were reasons that maybe I shouldn't have felt comfortable there. But I think... The fact that it was like my grandfather's place, they were so familiar with it. I had the run of it. I mean, I ran all over those hills from morning till night and only had one interesting situation happen to me. And that was out on the road that ran through the 
main section slightly off to the right of the 100 acres. And it went over an old bridge, and that old bridge was, oh, that old bridge was built back prior to the Civil War. And I had strange feelings there whenever I went near that bridge. We would always dare each other to go look under the bridge. There were stories associated with that bridge. And I think one time we went down and got part way looking under that bridge. And I said, no, I'm coming back. I'm not going down there. Now, that went over the creek that bordered the north edge of the fields, of that big open area of fields. There was a lot of things going on that property. We knew that it had been an Indian encampment. And I'd found lots of arrowheads, knives, knife points, spear points. I think we even found beads. And uh, I know we found some awls made out of bone. And they were all over this one field that was probably over a 60-acre area. And we would find, especially after plowing would happen, so we'd always walk the fields after the fields were plowed, and there was always arrowheads and whatnot that would turn up. And so I know that this place is ancient, but I always got the feeling that something lived underneath that bridge, and I, I didn't want to go see it. I... I never put two and two together with the dog man thing that I'd seen that night and the bridge, but nobody wanted to go underneath that bridge. So that creek is still there to this day, too. And that bridge is almost undoubtedly still there to this day. You said it never did give you the impression it was evil, of course, talking about that dog man. But did you ever have any lingering problems as a direct result of seeing it? Well, yeah. You know, as I grew older... Like some families, some situations, things happen, tragedies occur. You get wiser. You feel like you start getting a better, unfortunate, realistic view of the world, how the world actually is a dangerous place. And it was after that I went through that kind of maturing that I began questioning just how dangerous that thing might have been. But it took me maturing in order to be able to do that. And in terms of real emotional problems, sure, anything that happens to you that you carry with you is always going to have an effect on your emotions. At least it does for me. But I never felt like I was really compromised by it. But I was lucky. I mean, I was lucky listening to some of the encounters that I've heard. I mean, mine was pretty benign. I was lucky in the fact that I actually got to observe this thing from a position of relative safety. And also, one of the things that I believe contributed to that is the fact that this thing was young. By listening to all the other encounters and the size of them, this thing was likely a young male. And maybe it just did not have a really mean or vicious disposition. But I felt that that might have had something to do with it, the fact that it was younger and that it was basically doing what it was intending to do. But for all I know, this thing could have done anything. It certainly was powerful enough to. You know, it certainly is not something that I would ever want to meet out in the open without a lot of protection. Yeah, that probably wouldn't be a good thing. Well, Chaz, it's about time for us to get out of here, but before I have you give us your closing comments, I wanted to share three things with the listeners. Number one, if you've had an encounter of your own and would like to talk with me, it doesn't matter whether you want to come on to the show as a guest or you just want to speak with me in private about your encounter, please go to dogmanencounters.com, go to the Report Your Encounter page, and submit a report. The second thing I want to share with all of you is I recently posted several new encounters on the encounters slash sightings page of dogmanencounters.com. The new encounters I posted happened in Gothenburg, Sweden, Lynn County, Iowa, Trumbull County, Ohio, Jackson County, Kansas, Osage County, Kansas, and Minidoka County, Idaho. The last thing I want to share with you is, since I've been receiving so many requests for t-shirts and things like that since I stopped offering them for sale, it's not going to be too long before I've got t-shirts available for sale, sweatshirts, coffee mugs, bumper stickers, posters, and things like that all for the show. If you have an interest in buying your own Dog Man Encounters t-shirt or any of the other things I just mentioned, please keep your eyes posted on the podcast page of dogmanencounters.com 
because once the store is open and ready to go, I'll post a link to the store on the podcast page. All right, Jazz, now that I've got that out of the way, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Just that I appreciate the show. Listening to other people's encounters and the way you present it, Vic, has been really good for me. I feel better about what happened way back then. I feel like while it's still almost a bigger mystery, it's less of a confusing mystery. I just feel better about it, and I really appreciate the show, and I appreciate all the other people who come on and share their stories. It's something that I'll continue listening to and trying to figure out just what's going on with those things. Well, you know, we appreciate you, and we appreciate you taking the time to come on the show tonight and tell us about that experience. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Have a great night. All right. I will. You too. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.